Before we jump in slash into today's episode, I'd like to give a special shout out to Hyperviolent, the brand new sci-fi horror FPS that was just unleashed this week. Stranded in a desolate asteroid mine, you're tasked with navigating gore-filled hallways teeming with a menagerie of insanely horrific enemies with no one coming to save you. Your only hope to survive is employing both RPG and FPS mechanics, which include inventory management and upgrade pass, as well as dual wielding a huge arsenal of weapons, both long range and melee, in a near endless amount of combinations. In conjunction with those classic trappings, the old school pixel art and low poly aesthetic only raises the atmosphere as you try to unravel the madness that's taken hold of the Commodus station. If you think you have the nerves to survive, Hyperviolent is now available on Steam Early Access, the Epic Game Store, and GOG. Big thanks to Fulcrum Publishing for sponsoring today's video. Without further ado, let's start the show. Welcome back to another jumping and or bopping episode of What Happened, the show that digs its talons deep into pop culture history to pull out the most succulent developmental stories we can find. And when you're talking about video game history, really, there's no one that stands out more than Vex, the dark, ample attitude-having edgelord who, in 2003, um, yes, can I help you? Did somebody say words? No, they didn't. <sighs> anyway, due to bad timing, technological roadblocks, and uh, fate, I guess, Acclaim's attempt at creating a new hyper-marketable hero would fall well short of their goal. This is probably proven by the healthy percentage of you out there right now who are currently going, wait, what the hell is even this? Who is this spiky haired ruffian? Should I be trusting Matt when he inevitably tells me that Vex is the Cadillac of platforming mascots? These are all fair questions, but trust me when I say you should at least stick around as I answer the question, what happened to Vex? You're a fool for coming here. Now, we all remember Acclaim, right? They would publish anything they could get their hands on, but are probably best remembered as the publishers for the home ports of Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, NBA Jam, Turok, and Ben Batman Forever. However, when the huge wave of 3D platformers started hitting the market following Mario 64's success, well, that was all it took for Acclaim to want to join in on the fun and profits. In late 1999, Acclaim Studios Austin, formerly Iguana Entertainment, that, uh, wait, wait a minute, roll the serotonin inducing Iguana logo, please. <laughs> Go. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the stuff. Anyway, yes, Acclaim Austin had held a competition of sorts for platforming mascot pitches, with the hopes they could then turn it into a big franchise. One of the sources I spoke to for this video, who worked on Vex, gave me some insight into this early design process, and in general, a lot more Vexitude than I had initially bargained for. Amongst the ideas submitted, there were two front runners, a dog with a hammer space trench coat that worked like Santa's bag holding an infinite amount of tools, oh, we certainly missed out there, and another character named Glide, a reptilian creature who could swap out various gems on his chest, granting his wings different abilities. A brand new team whose task it was to create the next great 3D platformer was then formed, and despite what Acclaim Austin's upper management had said earlier, neither Glide or, I don't know, Ghost, Ghost Mutt. Mutt was carried over into the final game, so the team started fresh at the top of 2000, targeting Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo's next generation machines. At this early stage, the project started out pretty unrecognizable from the Vex that some of you barely remember today, so much so that the first few iterations of the game didn't even really feature the character at all. The team's initial design centered around not one, but two characters, by the names of Clip and Mischief, who would have functioned within the game as a duo. Clip, who was also later called Jinx for a time before they ran into copyright issues 
issues was a mute elfish hero, Avec Goggles, who would have been the main playable character, with Mischief, his wise cracking lizard sidekick, attaching himself to his partner, which would have expanded their moveset. While that might echo Rare's indelible, collectible, googly-eyed spectacle, Banjo-Kazooie, which a claim Austin used as a reference point to prove that a duo could be successful, visually, when you look at Clip and Mischief, the bear and bird might not be the first thing you would immediately think of. It's this issue in particular which leads to the first of many bumps in the road for our courageous Claude Conqueror. When developing games for consoles back around this time, it was necessary to submit detailed game summaries and documentation for a process known as content approval, and Clip and Mischief were no exception here. This submission included a thorough design doc detailing the characters, gameplay, and design philosophy behind Clip and Mischief, and it was shared by all three console manufacturers. Now, while it might seem like I've been foreshadowing that it was this which resulted in Vex's first major snag, the truth is, is that it was far more, uh, nuanced than you'd think. At E3 2001, oh right, a uh, rip to E3 by the way, no one knows what it's like. Sony Computer Entertainment and the Sony Computer Entertainment owned Naughty Dog unveiled Jack and Daxter, which the gaming world got excited about almost instantly. Acclaim Austin, however, were a bit less enthused, as Jack and Daxter had a startling amount of similarities to what they were doing with Clip and Mischief. Now, this occurs in the video game industry all the time, where one studio happens to be developing something really similar to another, with both projects even tracking to come out at the same time. There's your infamouses and prototypes, split seconds and blurs, and of course, the most hilarious of all, your overwatches and and Battleborns. One of the sources I spoke to explained that since their design document was submitted to Sony in 2000, some staff at Acclaim Austin felt that this might have gone beyond just great minds thinking alike. To reiterate, both featured a mute hero with elf ears and goggles, a talkative sassy sidekick, portals to traverse the worlds, and even a very specific set piece in Jack's E3 demo, where a pelican swooped in to steal away a precursor orb, which mirrored an identical scene laid out in their design document where a pterodactyl would do the exact same thing. My source made a great effort to stress that the team had absolutely no direct evidence and is making no accusations here and feels it's most likely a simple matter of coincidence. But even so, for a short time there was a conversation among the team about taking legal action. This was quickly shot down by leadership because upper management reasoned that if they wanted to continue selling games on the PlayStation Double Ballin', which by 2001 looked like it would continue to be the dominant console brand, they should maybe consider not raising a huge legal stink with Sony themselves, especially when it wasn't even something they could definitively prove. With little recourse left, they then decided it would be best to avoid direct comparisons with a big Sony first party title, so they dropped the mischief from Clip and Mischief and decided to focus on a singular pro tag. Though you might think it's as easy as highlighting mischief and hitting the delete key, the reality is obviously far more complicated, and the team's progress would ultimately be set back a good deal. Naughty Dog also had the distinct advantage of only having to target one platform instead of three, so despite all their effort, Acclaim Austin felt that they wouldn't have been able to directly compete with such a similar concept. As a final addendum to this whole did they just copy your game section of the story, many members of the team also did not believe there was some grand conspiracy at play here, only that there was perhaps the possibility that Sony could have just shared some design documents with leadership figures as a sort of competition analysis, given that they're headed into launching a variety of 3D mascot platformers of their own, and that it's possible that those within that circle could have been influenced by the the clip and mischief design document. As for our remaining character, Clip, well, he went through his own redesign process, which ever so slowly started to shift towards something with far more, oh, which word should I use here, edge, which in retrospect was probably the right call, as it would have helped him stand out a bit more. 
Eventually, the team also settled on the final name of Vex for two reasons. One, it sounded cool as shit, and two, they had to quit trying to navigate the legal issues of copywriting the name Jinx, as they had tried one last time. Vex is better anyway, I mean, I mean using double X's is always a huge dub. Since they were exploring a grimmer atmosphere, they had looked towards fantasy media like the Dark Crystal for inspiration. Uh, I'm just glad they never incorporated that weird noise that one gross Chozo constantly made. So while Acclaim Austin were now forging ahead with this fresh new angle after making the best of an unideal situation, it wasn't long before another big issue started to claw its way to the forefront. This time though, it wasn't about character design or copyright snafus, but it, it did involve Sony and its sixth generation juggernaut, which would go on to have massive ramifications throughout Vex's world. The level structure that the team were shooting for was initially very ambitious, and honestly, ahead of its time. There were going to be six massive biomes, composed of three levels each, which were all connected end-to-end, -end, allowing Vex free reign to travel from one area to the other fairly seamlessly. While the engine team at Acclaim Austin were immensely talented, they weren't miracle workers, and to make this design compatible across all three platforms would have taken a literal miracle. The Xbox had been their primary skew, with the intention of porting down to both the GameCube and PS2, and while a good bit of elbow grease could have gotten it working on the GameCube, the PS2 was the real problem. What's more is that during this time frame, third parties often had to adhere to strict platform holder policies, mandating that multi-platform games had to have gameplay parity, with no major differences between them. Yes, there was some wiggle room with specific console features, and plenty of teams got away with sneaking little differences in here and there, but you wouldn't have been able to have giant open levels in one version and stripped down truncated ones in another. It might have been possible to work around this in a more unique and elegant way, but lamentably, time is always the greatest of enemies, and Acclaim Austin was running out of it. The project had already seen a few delays and setbacks, and thus couldn't afford many more, so the six worlds and 18 levels were cut down and then recobbled together into nine much smaller levels, which is just an absolute ton of lost content. This is one of those situations where using the PS2 as the lead platform would have avoided this issue, but as we know, hindsight is always frustratingly 2020. What's worse is that since the team had so much restructuring ahead of them, a ton of other elements from the game had to be simplified or cut alongside it. Vex initially had a much more elaborate day and night system, with tons of events, missions, and gameplay concepts revolving around it. Unfortunately, they only really had time to have it affect enemies in the final build. Entire characters, boss fights, vehicles like a dragon hovercraft, and even core powers like a water suit were also scrapped, with its upgraded swim speed simply being applied to Vex's starting moveset. The one other element to the game outside of the levels that saw the most content excised, however, was the story and cutscenes, which wasn't even entirely due to the ticking clock of the looming release date, but rather a massive case of miscommunication. When legendary actor Brian Cox was approached to play both Darby and Dark Yabu, the person negotiating the contract during their dealings made an error in regards to his potential payday. But when Brian or his agent saw said number, they immediately agreed to the offer. It was then discovered later that the number was not in fact the amount earmarked for just Brian Cox, but it was the entire voice acting audio budget. And apparently, due to the binding nature of the contract Brian had agreed to, it was too late for a claim to back out, so they just kinda had to roll with it. Money wins. Obviously, to make up for this massive amount of missing money and lack of time, tons of additional story sequences had to be gutted from the game. Jesus effing Christ, can Vex catch a break here? Speaking of money, it was also something that was quickly running out at Acclaim, as they'd been recently hemorrhaging it from pretty much every orifice. 
Sales of key titles like Shadow Man, Two Ekin Coming, and What Happened All Stars, Turok Evolution, and BMX Triple X weren't exactly lighting the sales charts on fire, not to mention they had long since lost major brands like Mortal Kombat. So Acclaim was floundering and only made headlines when they spent money on over the top marketing gimmicks like gravestone adverts, giving babies dumb names, and of course, bloodvertising. Vex himself thankfully was spared of any such embarrassment, but it did have a slew of print advertisements that are so early 2000s it makes my teeth hurt. No coins, no rings, playtime is over. Video game has been. Hell yeah. Who do we got here? I, I guess uh, that's some weird green Sonic. That's. I, I don't know what. Oh, I don't know what that's supposed to be. And and is this some homunculus of Lara Croft and that girl from uh, Malice? Good enough. Acclaim did a decent job of supporting Vex with these adverts, but the intent was a bit off the mark. Spending more effort flexing on the old guard rather than being reflective of the game's actual qualities. When your main marketing tactic is to dump on the other guys rather than big yourself up, well, it rarely works in the gaming space, and the few times it had were firmly in the 90s and not, you know, 2003. What is very 2003, though, is a particular rarely seen promotional item, which I'll just, uh, I'll just let the picture do the talking. <laughs> Holy shit. And imagine the looks you'd get if you slapped that bad boy on. Unfortunately, you'll just have to settle for imagining such a scenario because these weren't actually distributed in the end. The manufacturer couldn't guarantee these would be effective in their main function, so members of the VEX team received them as free swag instead. Moving on, in terms of the critical reception, I... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm all right. Uh, Vex's critical reception was fairly divisive, with the PS2 bottoming out with a 63 on Metacritic, with both Xbox and GameCube versions faring better with a 70 and 71 respectively. If you want to talk about sales though, well, that's even harder to track down. Vex didn't appear on either the February 2003 or March 2003 NPD charts, with the only instance of any sort of sales data being a cromulent post post from NeoGAF back in 2004, which reportedly placed VEX's entire launch year sales at just over 20,000 units across all platforms. Oof. Between the time after the last bit of code was written and before the game's discs arrived in stores, Acclaim Austin were doing conceptual work on a sequel. And like so many other stories I've covered before, this sequel sounded super cool, even at this very early concept stage. While a heavy metal inspired attitude was considered at first, the team eventually started leaning towards JoJo-like stands that Vex could control, and I'm, I'm not editorializing here. This was modeled directly after Stardust Crusaders, as some members of the staff were fans of the 90s OVA. Help, Darby is in fact named after JoJo's famous gambler, Daniel J. Darby. All of this potential was snuffed out, however, when it had become evident that Vex wasn't a commercial hit, so members of the team shifted focus onto the Red Star, which was already being developed by another team at Acclaim Austin, and eventually went on to finish it, before the Red Star had its publishing rights picked up by Excess Games once Acclaim had gone belly up. Oh right, due to a confluence of factors and those several high-profile retail bombs, Acclaim filed for bankruptcy in 2004. Not so fun fact, Acclaim Austin wasn't even told of this impending shutdown. They just arrived to work one day to find their office doors chained up and were unable to collect their belongings. So while this attempt at creating the next big Acclaim franchise during their twilight years didn't quite pay off and some aspects of the final product are a bit on the undercooked side, it still shows that even with the best of intentions, sometimes there are things you can't predict or are completely out of your control, which can prove to be extremely vexing. Hey, you're waiting for it and there it was. 
Thanks again to all the sources I spoke to for the clarification, and if you out there know of any other development stories so edgy I'll likely cut one of my boned fingers, let me know in the comments below or claw your way up over to my Twitter. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Thank you.